Director Cordray. I just wanted to make sure I knew where we were today. So. <laughs> Thank you, uh, all of you, uh, for joining us here today. Uh, in Dallas. Every month or so, we try to hold an event outside of Washington, D.C. with the purpose of learning firsthand about how consumer financial products and services are affecting people around the country. Today, we're here to talk about arbitration, which is a way to resolve disputes outside of the court system. Rather than take the issue before a judge or perhaps a jury, the two parties turn to a third party, known as an arbitrator, to decide the dispute. Many business contracts contain a pre-dispute arbitration clause, which states that once the contract is agreed to, the parties will resolve all future disputes through arbitration rather than through the courts. More recently, many contracts for consumer financial products and services have been written with such arbitration clauses as well. Arbitration is often described by supporters as a better alternative to the court system, more convenient, more efficient, and a lower cost way of resolving disputes. Opponents argue that arbitration clauses deprive consumers of certain legal protections available in court and may serve to quash a dispute rather than to provide an alternative way to resolve it. There's a long and interesting history in this country of the relationship between arbitration and the judicial system as alternative means of resolving disputes. In 1925, Congress first enacted the Federal Arbitration Act to make written agreements to arbitrate certain disputes, including those arising out of contracts, enforceable in the courts. Rather than obtaining a legal judgment from a court, parties to an arbitration agreement would be bound by an arbitration award which could be confirmed but generally not reviewed or overturned by a court. The new federal law was explicitly enacted to address previous judicial hostility to arbitration agreements, which had been held by many courts to be revocable at any time by either party. Indeed, some courts had sought to protect their own jurisdiction by rejecting arbitration clauses outright and found, found them to be void in violation of public policy. For four decades after the Federal Arbitration Act was adopted, the federal courts maintained a skeptical and restrictive view of arbitration. In 1953, for example, the Supreme Court held that arbitration clauses could not be used to waive the right to a federal judicial forum granted under substantive federal statutes such as the securities laws. The heart of the court's position was that the buyer of a security was being required to give up an advantage granted to him under the federal law at a time when he was at a disadvantage in terms of knowledge. Starting in the late 1960s, however, the law took a dramatic turn. And over the next couple of decades, the Supreme Court expressly overruled much of the prior case law in this area. During this period, which extends to the present day, the court revised its previous views of the Federal Arbitration Act. In fact, it is now determined that the statute evinces a core policy favoring arbitration as a means of resolving disputes, including where the matters at issue are governed by various other substantive federal and state laws. As judicial doctrine on arbitration has evolved, though, one basic premise of the doctrine has become clear. It is Congress that has the authority to adopt laws to regulate dispute resolution procedures in the manner that it deems most conducive to the administration of justice. Where Congress addresses arbitration as a method of dispute resolution, either generally or in particular federal statutes, then the courts must follow its lead. The Dodd-Frank Act is one such statute in which Congress diverged from the general policy of favoring arbitration as expressed in the Federal Arbitration Act. In Section 1414 of the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress expressly prohibited the inclusion of arbitration clauses in most residential mortgage loan contracts. In Section 921, Congress gave the Securities and Exchange Commission the authority to prohibit or restrict use of such clauses for certain disputes if it finds that doing so would be in the public interest and for the protection of investors. And in Section 1028, Congress expressly addressed the applicability of pre-dispute arbitration clauses in connection with the offering or providing of consumer financial products or services. The statute establishes a clear procedure to be used to determine whether such agreements should be prohibited, conditioned, or limited in any way. First, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is to conduct a study and provide a report to Congress concerning the use of such agreements. 
Second, the Bureau may adopt regulations that prohibit or impose conditions or limitations on the use of such agreements if it finds such measures to be in the public interest and for the protection of consumers. And such findings are consistent with the study that the Bureau has conducted. That's what brings us to the subject of today's discussion. In the world of consumer financial products and services, these clauses are quite common. If you were to look in your wallet right now, the chances are high that one or more of your credit cards, debit cards, or prepaid cards would be subject to a pre-dispute arbitration clause. The clauses are contained in standard form contracts where the terms are not subject to negotiation. Like the other terms of most consumer financial products, they are essentially take-it-or-leave-it propositions. Consumers may open a new account or take on a new product without being aware of what the contract says or without fully understanding its implications. We have begun the arbitration study mandated by Congress and we now have a first round of preliminary findings to present for general consideration. We have also narrowed and specified many of the remaining areas on which we are most likely to focus as we complete our work to issue the required report to Congress. Although we have more work ahead of us, we know this is an important topic in the realm of consumer finance. So we wanted to share some of our initial research in order to facilitate a broader discussion about issues such as where these clauses are found, what they say, and what we have learned about arbitration filings by consumers. To date, we've focused on a few key consumer markets, including credit cards and checking accounts. One of our most notable findings about arbitration clauses in these markets is the stark contrast in the types of institutions that use them. On the whole, larger institutions are more likely to include an arbitration clause in consumer contracts than community banks or credit unions. That raises interesting questions about why smaller institutions and credit unions do not use arbitration clauses as frequently in these markets. While arbitration clauses are more common from larger credit card or checking account issuers, the same cannot be said about prepaid cards. Perhaps because it's a newer or more highly concentrated market, we found that arbitration clauses are very common across all prepaid card contracts, regardless of whether they're offered by a larger or smaller player. In fact, smaller players are much more likely to use arbitration clauses in prepaid card contracts than they are in credit card or checking account contracts. Our study looked not only at which institutions use arbitration clauses, but also what these clauses say. Regardless of who was using them, arbitration clauses and credit card agreements were almost always more complex and written at a more demanding grade level of readability than the other parts of the contracts we studied. In fact, in every case, the rest of the credit card contracts scored better in terms of readability than did its arbitration clause considered alone. More than 90% of the arbitration clauses we looked at explicitly bar consumers from participating in class arbitrations. The few clauses without this express limitation were in smaller bank contracts, meaning that almost all of the consumers who are subject to arbitration provisions are effectively precluded from participating in class proceedings, whether in court or in arbitration. We plan to spend more time analyzing and considering class actions in the second phase of our study. Although one, about one quarter of the clauses contained in checking account and credit card contracts allow consumers to opt out of the arbitration requirement. For those that allow it, consumers usually have to submit a signed document by mail within a set time frame, usually 30 or 60 days from when the account was opened or the agreement was mailed. A consumer who wants to resolve a dispute through arbitration generally must file with a private arbitration organization that is named in the clause. For the consumer financial products we have received, reviewed, the named organization is typically the American Arbitration Association, called the AAA. We've obtained records on all consumer arbitration cases filed with the AAA between 2010 and 2012. There were about 1,250 such filings about credit cards, checking accounts, payday loans, and prepaid cards. About 900 of those were filed by consumers. The rest were filed by companies, or in some instances, the consumer and the company filed together. The vast majority of these filings were about credit cards. In most cases, the consumers were represented by counsel. In virtually all cases, the companies were. Almost all filings involved individual consumers. Only two class arbitrations were filed for these product markets. 
Although we have some way to go in looking at litigation alternatives, we've identified more than 3,000 federal court cases filed by consumers over the same period from 2010 through 2012 about credit card issues alone. That includes more than 400 class actions in which one or more individuals may seek relief on behalf of many other consumers as well, sometimes even millions of other consumers. For those consumers who do use arbitration, we observe that very few of them actually filed arbitration claims for small dollar amounts. For example, there are almost no disputes over amounts less than $1,000. A number of arbitration clauses come with a carve-out for small claims, meaning that both the company and the consumer retain the option to use small claims courts rather than the arbitration process to resolve such matters. So these carve-outs could explain why there are very few small dollar arbitration filings. Yet our preliminary, preliminary analysis casts doubt on this hypothesis for it indicates that at least when it comes to credit card disputes, consumers do not appear to file many cases in small claims court. Indeed, we found the cases filed in small claims court are much more likely to be brought by banks than by consumers. As an initial step in comparing the benefits to consumers from arbitration and class action litigation, we've identified a number of class actions involving credit cards, deposit accounts, or payday loans that were settled since July 2009 and where the contract at issue allowed for arbitration before the AAA. Consumers who were members of these classes in these cases had the option of opting out of the class settlement and bringing their own case through arbitration. In such cases as we've identified thus far, more than 13 million class members made claims or received payments under these settlements, whereas 3,605 individuals opted out. At most, only a handful of those individuals who opted out chose instead to file an arbitration claim. One significant takeaway from these various points is that few consumers use arbitration at all at least when compared to the number of consumers involved in lawsuits and class actions. In the second phase of our study, we will seek to obtain a better understanding of what explains the incidence and nature of arbitration claims, including small dollar claims. We will look to see what happens to arbitration filings and endeavor to compare what we see happening in arbitration to what we see happening in litigation, including class litigation. Those are challenging comparisons to make for a variety of reasons, but we intend to engage in a thoughtful process in order to understand how arbitration clauses affect both consumers and businesses. We also are proposing to conduct a survey of consumers in the credit card marketplace to determine such matters as whether they're aware of the terms of arbitration clauses, whether they make assumptions about their legal rights under the terms of these clauses, and whether they factor the existence of these clauses into their decision-making process about obtaining or using particular consumer financial products and services. These are only some of the areas we'll be pursuing before submitting our report to Congress. We recognize that Congress intends the results of the study to be the basis for important policy decisions that the Consumer Bureau will have to make in this area. And so today we invite you to share your thoughts on that process and about these issues. Tell us about any experiences you've had with arbitration clauses and share your input on these issues. At the Consumer Bureau, we're dedicated to a marketplace characterized by fair, transparent, and responsible business practices. We believe that strong consumer protection is an asset to honest businesses because it ensures that everyone is playing by the same rules, which supports fair competition. We also envision a marketplace where educated consumers can make well-informed decisions about their financial affairs. We look forward to a robust and vigorous discussion today, which will bring us one step closer to achieving that vision. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cordray. At this time, I'd invite all our panelists to please take the stage. And while they're doing so, I'm going to introduce them. Meredith Fuchs joined the CFPB in 2011 as Principal Deputy General Counsel before serving as Chief of Staff to Director Cordray. Prior to joining the CFPB, she served as Chief Investigative Counsel of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce. She now serves as the Bureau's General Counsel. Will Wade Gary is Senior Counselor in the Division of Research, Markets, and Regulation. Prior to joining the Bureau in 2011, he was a Financial Services partner in the New York offices of Morrison Forrester LLP. Our guest panelists include Ellen Taverna, Legislative Director of the National Association of Consumer Advocates, 
Richard Frankel, Associate Professor of Law, Drexel University School of Law. Christine Hines, Consumer and Civil Justice Counsel, Public Citizen. Scott Shea, Senior Counsel with Nissan Motor Acceptance Corporation, representing the American Financial Services Association. Jess Sharp, Executive Director, Center for Capital Markets Competitiveness with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And Shannon Phillip, Deputy General Counsel with the Independent Bankers Association of Texas. Meredith, you have the floor. Great. Thank, thank you, Sixta. Is this on? Thank you all for coming here today. As you've heard, we're here today to address an important consumer issue, arbitration as it relates to consumer financial matters, and in particular, pre-dispute arbitration clauses. When you, the consumer, obtain a financial product or service, like a credit card, a payday loan, a checking account, a prepaid card, and so on, you generally receive a written contract from the company involved. That isn't true for all your other transactions. You don't generally receive a contract when you go and buy groceries, or you go to the movies, or you buy your gasoline, but you do when you receive a consumer financial product, the products that my agency is concerned about. As Director Cordray noted, in some cases, not in all cases, those contracts for consumer financial product or service contain a pre-dispute arbitration clause. Generally, generally, these clauses say if a dispute arises between the company and the consumer, or the consumer and the company, either side has the right to have the dispute resolved not in a court of law, but in an arbitration. This may be why the clauses are sometimes called mandatory. Either side can mandate the use of arbitration, even if the other side would prefer to go to court. And they're known as pre-dispute clauses because the parties sign on to the contract before any dispute has arisen. As more and more companies have added these clauses to their contracts, the use of these clauses has become quite controversial. Opponents of arbitration, and I'm sure we have some of those here today in the audience, say that these create an unfair process because they eliminate important procedural protections and may be biased against consumers. They also contend that arbitration clauses, by eliminating class actions or by reducing the opportunity for discovery, may effectively immunize companies from a range of private civil liabilities. Finally, critics say that arbitration, which is almost always conducted in private, undermines transparency in the rule of law. In contrast, proponents of arbitration, who are also <laughs> represented here today, say arbitration is faster, more efficient, more cost effective for all the parties than the court system. They argue the cost savings it creates benefits consumers in terms of lower prices. And they contend that while arbitration may impact class proceedings, such class proceedings typically are meritless, inefficient, and provide little or no benefit to consumers. In short, they are, argue that arbitration is a better, for consumers and for companies, alternative than going to court. As you can see, there is quite a difference of opinion. And so we're here today to hear more about those views from the different sides and from you, the wider public. We're going to start today with brief remarks from each of our panelists, starting with Ellen Taverna and moving across the panel. So Ellen. Why don't you start? Thank you for inviting me to participate today. Uh, my name is Alan Taverna. I'm the Legislative Director of the National Association of Consumer Advocates, a national nonprofit organization representing thousands of consumers victimized by fraudulent and abusive corporate practices. We have seen time and again how forced arbitration directly impacts the lives of American families and our nation's service members. Imagine returning home from a war zone only to find you have no home to return to. Consider this recent case of a US military service member. While he was on active duty for our country, a national mortgage lender foreclosed on his home. Despite the fact that there's federal law, the Service Member Civil Relief Act clearly stops foreclosures while a service member is on active duty. Nonetheless, the mortgage lender sold the service member's home while he was deployed in Iraq. It's in clear violation of a, of, of a federal law. When this service member tried to enforce his rights under the law, he found that a forced arbitration buried in the fine print of his mortgage contract would not allow him to hold the lender accountable. Because of a forced arbitration clause, he lost his right to a day in court and his constitutionally guaranteed right to a jury trial. All Americans 
uh, financial securities at risk here. Years of research already establishes how harmful forced arbitration is to consumers. The CFPB study today further demonstrates that forced arbitration clauses have become standard business practice in contracts for financial products like payday loans, credit cards, and checking accounts. Consumers have absolutely no idea that just by purchasing a financial product, they are giving up constitutional rights by waiving access to the court system. Forced arbitration strips consumers of fundamental rights, such as the right to a trial, a right to a jury, and the right to join with other consumers to hold corporations accountable. Across the board, the CFPB study demonstrates arbitration clauses give businesses the license to steal. How is this possible? It's because corporations get to write all the rules for the arbitration. Only the corporations get to control who the arbitrator will be, under what rules the arbitration will take place, the state the arbitration will occur in, and the payment terms for the arbitration. When banks write the rules, consumers lose every time. One egregious example required a disabled consumer who lives in New York to travel across the country to Arizona. Let me repeat this. She's a disabled consumer, and she has to travel across the country to Arizona to argue to an arbitrator that it's cost prohibitive and unconscionable for her to force her to arbitrate her case in, in Arizona. And because this arbitration forum is typically chosen by the corporation, arbitrators have an incentive to rule in the corporation's favor if they want to be selected by the corporation again in the future. To make matters worse, forced arbitration is almost always conducted in secret. For example, for example, later this month, a forced arbitration proceeding is to commence in California involving an 82-year-old cancer patient's case against a lender. It's a challenging a 94% APR car title loan that he was told was only 8% and for which he had to turn over as collateral his sole asset, a classic car. Because of forced arbitration, these facts will never be publicly known and the lender will be free to cheat other elderly consumers in the same way. Recent Supreme Court decisions have spurred the widespread use of abusive forced arbitration clauses. In 2000, uh, 2011, the court held that corporations may use arbitration clauses to deny consumers their right to join together in class actions to hold corporations accountable. CFPB studies today reveals that about 90% 90 90 of arbitration clauses now expressly bar consumers from joining together as a class. This has an enormous impact on consumers where the value of claims can be small individually, but large in the aggregate, and class, class actions are the only way of revealing widespread corporate fraud. As a consequence, it's not economically feasible for consumers to individually file claims in any forum, arbitration or court, and banks get off scot-free. On behalf of all the consumers and service members whose rights have been decimated by forced arbitration, I urge the Bureau to complete a study as quickly as possible so that it can initiate rulemaking to eliminate forced arbitration clauses from consumer financial contracts. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Richard? Director Cordray, uh, members of the Bureau, thank you for inviting me to participate in this important dialogue regarding binding mandatory arbitration. I want to applaud the Bureau for the time it has dedicated to undertaking such a thorough and detailed and thoughtful preliminary analysis of arbitration in the financial services area. While the current system of binding mandatory arbitration may have once been motivated by the desire to create uh, a speedy and efficient alternative to court, it has exploded in recent years and transformed far beyond its original purposes, and most often in a way that harms rather than helps consumers. Um, arbitration clauses have become commonplace, particularly in the field of financial services. In check, uh, they are common in contracts for checking accounts, credit cards, payday loans, and other services. And while Meredith mentioned uh, that you don't uh, yet have to uh, agree to arbitrate when you buy your groceries, I actually recently just read an article uh, by a group of defense lawyers actually recommending that companies slap arbitration clauses onto food labels uh, so that when you, uh, if you happen to buy tainted meat at the grocery store, you are now going to have to proceed in arbitration. So that may be actually coming down, down the line. Um, arbitration clauses are often buried in fine print using complicated and difficult to understand language or sometimes uh, they're included well after the fact in change of, in change of terms bill stuffers uh, that consumers uh, receive in the mail uh, well after uh, they've signed up for the financial product or service. 
Um, they often don't realize that their contracts contain arbitration clauses um, when they're purchasing a service. Uh, and they, they don't discover this until the dispute actually arises and they learn that they actually uh, cannot go to court and they have to, uh, are required to submit to arbitration. This is not the system of knowing uh, and voluntary agreement to opt out of court that arbitration was intended to be. Uh, I think these facts are significant because arbitration has changed from a system designed to provide individuals with an alternative form of justice uh, to one that often denies them any access to justice at all. Uh, companies often write arbitration clauses in ways that stack the deck in their favor. Uh, most notably, they ban class actions and other forms of collective relief, which enable them uh, to violate the rights of thousands or even millions of consumers with virtual immunity from any sort of prosecution. Uh, they may limit damages recovery, shorten statutes of limitations, um, impose high costs on consumers, uh, and insulate them from any meaningful form themselves from any meaningful form of judicial review of the arbitrator's decision. Uh, the results of the preliminary study, which uh, show that very few consumers uh, initiate an arbitration, I think, confirm uh, the, the the denial of access to justice that occurs through the use of arbitration. And while while courts used to police some of the worst abuses of the arbitration system, I think that has changed as the Supreme Court has upheld some of the more uh, claim suppressive aspects of arbitration clauses in recent years. Uh, the court's full-throated endorsement of arbitration, even when it's expressly acknowledged that uh, arbitration clauses will prevent individuals from vindicating their rights, uh, uh, um, it's going to likely cause, I think, even more consumers to use arbitration clauses, or more companies to use arbitration clauses in the future. And that's why I think it's that much more important for agencies like the Bureau to do the kind of work they are doing and determine whether regulation is necessary and in the best interest of consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Let's turn to Christine. Thank you. I'm grateful to be here today on behalf of Public Citizen. Thank you to the CFPB for conducting this forced arbitration study. While the study is required by statute, this data has been both illuminating and, and validating. The widespread use of forced arbitration clauses in everyday contracts is one of the most critical threats to consumer rights today. During the negotiation of the Dodd-Frank Act, consumer advocates strongly supported the legislation and fought hard to ensure that the new agency, the CFPB, would have the opportunity to fix this national problem of forced arbitration in the consumer financial services sector. It's important that we as consumers have the ability to enforce our rights as we maneuver around in a changing and complex financial marketplace. Based on the CFPB data released today, it is clear that institutions that dominate the financial services market use forced arbitration clauses in their consumer contracts and that very few consumers bring their claims in secret arbitration. Consumers prefer the, prefer the court system. It's clear that these clauses suppress legal complaints against financial institutions, rob the public of information about wrongdoing, and halt the development of our consumer laws. At Public Citizen, we are concerned about sophisticated parties with superior bargaining power who get to write rules restricting individuals basic constitutional right to a civil jury trial and then bury those rules in the dense, fine print of their take it or leave it contracts. Over the years, we have gathered and shared information about consumers who were unable to file lawsuits after being defrauded or cheated by unlawful or predatory corporate practices. We believe that the Federal Arbitration Act, which governs arbitration, has been interpreted to the point where that law has warped all sense of fairness or justice and has given corporations a get out of jail free card. As we have observed over the last several years, the mere existence of an arbitration clause in a contract has simply crushed consumer claims. Corporations can collect a small amount of money from millions of consumers, such as illegal fees or exorbitant interest rate charges in lending transactions. It makes no economic sense for a single consumer to take on these claims on her own. And when these contracts contain forced arbitration clauses and class action bans, the consumers cannot go to court to seek redress, and the result is a huge 
an undeserved windfall for the violators. Judges who have reluctantly dismissed consumer lawsuits have commented that the harm the consumers may have suffered in these cases would have been better addressed in class actions, partially because the only other option was that the claims would not be addressed at all. If we can bring our grievances to a public court, not only can we obtain recovery for our losses, but our private actions increase the chances that state and federal agencies will investigate and become aware of widespread misconduct. Or maybe that journalists will report these cases and present important issues to the public. When Dodd-Frank Act passed in 2010, authorizing the CFPB to ban forced arbitration, the state of the law on arbitration was bad, but it's dire now. Since then, over the last several years, Supreme Court precedent has put a buzzsaw on consumers' rights. Would the 2010 Dodd-Frank Congress have banned forced arbitration outright in all consumer financial services if they knew how severe matters would become? The lack of corporate accountability was considered a major factor in causing the 2008 financial crisis. The ongoing purging of consumers' legal remedies that's occurred since then probably would have been a red flag for lawmakers, a warning that corporate accountability could decline even more if consumers who are on the front lines buying financial products and services could not band together to sue a company for wrongdoing that injured them. Fortunately, Congress gave us the CFUB and the CFUB authority to act, and there remains hope that the agency will restore our rights and protect us from this deeply unfair practice. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we're going to move over to this side now to Shannon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. I represent the Independent Bankers Association of Texas. We're a, an association of about 450 member banks, community banks, from ranging in size from, size from 20 million in assets to about 15 billion, with the majority of them being under 500 million in assets. We do appreciate the opportunity today to testify or to comment, I should say. As noted above, the IBAT membership is diverse with a large number of very small to medium-sized banks. Most of those institutions do not currently use arbitration clauses in their standard agreements. Their documents typically are produced by software platform systems. The most common of these in Texas does not include consumer arbitration provisions in documents provide, but provide for a separate standalone agreement. Further, many of the medium-sized banks are evaluating the need for arbitration provisions in their agreements at this time. The largest community banks do include consumer arbitration agreements within their deposit accounts and other documents. IBAP believes it's critical to retain the flexibility for community banks of all sizes to appropriately use well-drafted, fair arbitration agreements. And we do mean that. We do mean well-drafted and fair. In, rec in the recent Supreme Court case, AT Mobility, versus Concepcion, the decision provided businesses with a template for fair arbitration provisions and consumer contracts. In that case, AT&T's agreement included a reasonable venue provision, the business bore the cost of arbitration, and the consumer would receive a stipulated damage award if he prevailed, rather than merely actual damages. IBAT would suggest that this development has provided consumers with adequate, adequate protections and assure further that arbitration is fair to consumers. In Texas, Community banks have seen firsthand out of control class actions can be used to the advantage of pl the plaintiff's bar without real benefits to the consumers. Numerous class actions have been filed complaining, actually sometimes erroneously, that signs were missing from ATM machines related to fees for non-customers. Although this technical violation of Regulation E, Although, excuse me, although this is a technical violation of Regulation E, the consumers cannot proceed with a transaction without receiving a very specific message on the screen as to that fee and then clicking a button to accept the fee. Congress has fixed that issue with legislation that took away the necessity for a <coughs> physical sign in addition to on-screen notifications of fees. However, it's just an example of how out-of-control class actions or out-of-control uh, plaintiff's lawyers can take advantage of, of regulations. We're also concerned that this, of the CFPB relating to mandatory arbitration clauses could result in an indirect amendment to the Federal Arbitration Act. In turn, this would create a bifurcated system, special rules for financial services companies, and clear federal law as approved by the United States 
Supreme Court for all other parties. Although the study and review is directed to arbitration, we have concerns that it could also affect all alternative dispute resolution options. Alternative dispute resolution in Texas state courts, which includes arbitration, is governed by our Civil Practices and Remedies Code, which officially sets the procedures that can be used. Generally, mediation, many trials, and moderated settlement conferences create a privilege of mediation alternative dispute resolution proceedings and sets strictly enforced limits on forcing mediators to testify. The decision whether to set a case for mediation generally lies in the individual state court, but Chapter 152 of the Civil Practices and Remedies Code allows counties to establish a mediation system. Most urban Texas courts utilize mediation alternative dispute resolution as an effective means of reducing their workload. These courts rely on Chapter 154 of the Civil Practices and Remedies Code as authority for doing this. Without alternative dispute resolution, Texas would need to establish many more civil courts at a significant cost, both to taxpayers and litigants. It is our understanding that many other states have similar state laws and practices. Any eventual CFPB prohibition on pre-dispute arbitration and consumer transaction would clearly run counter to these state court efforts to reduce the caseloads of state courts. I will say when I first started practicing law, there was an attorney, an older attorney who talked to me. We were, I was getting involved in some mediation and told me he didn't like mediation because it was taking money out of his pocket. He was not at all concerned with the consumer. He was concerned with <coughs> the consumers not coming to attorneys and paying them to take these, things, these matters to court. I would like to say in conclusion that if after studying the issue, the CFPB determines that it must regulate the utilization of pre-dispute arbitration and consumer transaction, we would, cons we would urge them to use an approach supported by the U.S. Supreme Court in Concepcion and require reasonable parameters for consumer transactions. For example, the CFPB could focus its regulation on requiring arbitration clauses to be clear and conspicuous and that consumers voluntarily agree to pre-dispute arbitration. And I have to say I have seen arbitration clauses that are not clear and conspicuous, and I have to say I have also seen arbitration clauses that, that are clear and conspicuous. But thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Let's move on to Jess. Uh, good morning. My name is Jess Sharp with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for having me here to participate in this, uh, this event this morning. Um, I think the fundamental question uh, before us and before the CFPB uh, is how do the different dispute resolution options stack up against each other uh, in terms of the consumer benefits? We've heard a lot this morning about sort of the inputs, but I, uh, I really think uh, at some point we need to focus a little bit more uh, uh, narrowly on the outputs. Are consumers better served uh, in the final result uh, under class actions, under arbitration, when they go to court? Uh, ultimately, legitimate businesses want the same thing from a dispute resolution system that consumers do, a way to vindicate legitimate grievances, grievances that works in the real world, not just in theory, a system in which the money expended is focused on compensating legitimate claims, not on legal fees to either side, um, and a system that can't be gained by lawyers, again, on either side. And we think arbitration meets this test. Uh, it's quicker, it's cheaper, and more efficient than litigation in court, and therefore provides access to justice for claims that consumers could not pursue in court. Studies have shown that consumers do as well or better in arbitration as compared to court. Again, thinking about the results. Arbitration also reduces transaction costs for businesses, which can help them uh, charge uh, lower prices. Um, now, we've documented uh, each of these points uh, extensively in a 58-page comment letter we recently uh, submitted to the CFPB. Um, now, with respect to the preliminary results that, we've, that have just been released, obviously there's a lot to digest, and I can uh, assure you that we'll take the opportunity to, to continue to comment and take you up on your, on your offer for us to do so. But uh, I've got a couple quick uh, uh, preliminary reactions to the preliminary results. And the first is uh, uh, the finding that most arbitration agreements use the AAA. Uh, to, to resolve disputes is a good thing. I think they're viewed as the gold standard in the industry, so I think that's, that, that's, that's a good fact to have on, out on the table. And then although, this goes back to results, although the Bureau's analysis of claims filed in the past may be useful, a critical question not addressed that now must be is how well these methods work for the types of claims consumers have. In other words, if I'm a consumer with a claim, uh, what is the relative accessibility, cost, fairness, efficiency of the different methods of dispute resolution? Third, the focus on the number of claims uh, filed also ignores a critical step in the, pre in the dispute resolution process. Not everything gets to arbitration. Um, the CFPB has, has created a consumer complaint database, database and multiple ways in which uh, the, the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau actually serves as an intermediary to get 
uh, relief for consumers on sort of uh, uh, on, on, a, on a fairly quick turnaround. Um, and I think uh, companies, uh, not just as a result of the CFPB's compl consumer complaint portal, but obviously it's in the company's interest to resolve uh, uh, sort of everyday disputes uh, as, as, as quickly and as efficiently as they can. So not everything even needs to arise to uh, the level of, of a formal arbitration. So I think there's a story to tell beneath that level of 900 uh, arbitrations that you found in your study. And the last point is the report mentions that arbitration agreements typically preclude, uh, preclude class proceedings. That's come up a number of times this morning. Uh, that argument poses an important policy question. Again, back to my uh, results point earlier. Should consumers lose the benefits of arbitration, in particular the ability to pursue individual claims that cannot realistically be pursued in court in order to protect class actions? We believe the answer is no for two basic reasons. Consumer class actions deliver at best minimal benefits uh, to most consumers. And we submitted to the Bureau, in addition to our comment letter, uh, a fairly uh, extensive study of, of class actions uh, that we hope you'll take a look at uh, that focuses on the results and the benefits to consumers. Um, and really, I think sort of the, the punchline there is none of the class actions studied results in a trial or in a judgment for the plaintiffs on the merits. Most class actions are either dismissed voluntarily uh, uh, by one side or the other. Class members don't benefit in these situations. And the remaining minority of class actions that are settled on a class-wide on a class -wide basis, uh, only a very, very small uh, percentage, as low as less than 1% uh, of those, uh, those who could uh, file a claim actually do. Very, there's very little recovery through a class action. So again, consumers really aren't benefiting. Someone else is, but they're not consumers through class actions. So we should be careful about putting class actions on a pedestal as the preferred alternative here. Uh, so thank you. Sorry I went a little over my time, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So let's turn to Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning for a few more minutes. <laughs> I'm Scott Shea. I'm the Senior Counsel of Consumer Finance Compliance at ne Nissan Motor Acceptance Corporation. I'm speaking today on behalf of the American Financial Services Association, uh, or AFSA, the National Trade Association for the Consumer Credit Industry, one of whose goals is protecting access to credit and promoting consumer choice in credit opportunities. AFSA encourages and maintains ethical business practices and supports financial education for consumers of all ages. AFSA's 350 member companies include consumer and commercial finance companies, vehicle finance companies, credit card issuers, mortgage lenders, industrial banks, and other financial service firms that lend to consumers and small business. Today I focus my remarks on the benefits of arbitration and the ways that the CFPB could improve its arbitration fact-finding study, which we understand is moving into its next phase. A number of published studies in arbitration show that consumers prevail more often than businesses in cases they go to arbitration. The majority of consumer arbitrations result in monetary or non-monetary recovery for the consumer. Arbitration is quicker than bringing a lawsuit in the crowded and overburdened federal and state court judicial system. Consumers may file and pursue arbitration at minimal cost. In sum, when compared to lawsuits, arbitration is a fair, quick, and inexpensive option for consumers. AFSA is concerned that the CFPB will use the study results to improperly restrict the use of arbitration agreements. Regarding the supposed complexity of the arbitration provision in contracts, AFSA believes that consumers do not need to memorize the dispute provisions in their agreements. They only need to be able to find the provision when they need to. Many consumers have brought arbitrations, meaning they are able to find the necessary information and engage the process. The CFPB's study should focus on whether pre-dispute arbitration or litigation or class action litigation gives consumers a better chance to tell their stories in front of a fair decision maker, which is ultimately what consumers want. To this end, the CFPB should also carefully study the speed of reaching decisions and the costs of pre-dispute arbitration compared to litigation. Additionally, the CFPB should contact and interview consumers who have used the arbitration process to address their disputes to determine their level 
of satisfaction with the process. We believe that the CFPB will find a higher satisfaction level from these consumers as opposed to consumers who were included in a class action litigation, which, by the way, the CFPB should also study to adequately assess the value of arbitration. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. AFSA is committed to assisting the CFPB in conducting a comprehensive study with accurate and meaningful results. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for extremely thoughtful opening remarks. Um, we're going to do some questions now, and I'm going to start us off with a question um, for Christine and Richard and Ellen. Um, and my question is, uh, we've heard uh, lots of uh, interesting perspectives so far. Do you think that the average consumer should be concerned about arbitration provisions, and if so, why? Sure. I mean, I, I think that every American's financial security is at, at risk here. I think that um, what these forced arbitration clauses do is that they eliminate uh, consumers' right uh, to go to trial, and they are give the corporations a license to steal and violate the law. Um, I think, yes, definitely consumers should be concerned. They should be outraged. Uh, I know that I'm outraged as a consumer, as a mother, when I'm looking to buy uh, a financial product or outside the realm of what the CFPB is looking at, any real product, that, they, that I'm uh, forced uh, to go to arbitration and I'm not able to use my constitutional right uh, for, for, to go to court for a jury trial um, and that the, corp the company escapes uh, complete accountability. Um, and we know that other uh, consumers believe this as well. We've initiated a petition along with Texas Watch and Take Justice Back um, that w over 18,000 consumers have signed this position um, urging the CFPB to re restore accountability by banning forced arbitration. Um, I think that I think that consumers, they, they need to know and that, that looking at the CFPB study that uh, basically these corporations are, are given a get out of, of jail free card for, for having these arbitration clauses in. Sure. Uh, I, I also agree that consumers should be concerned. I mean, generally, if you, have, if you are wronged, the right to go to court to remedy that wrong is guaranteed by the Constitution. I think anyone should be concerned when they are required to sacrifice a constitutional right as a condition of signing up for a credit card uh, or checking account or any other product. Um, and I think that's all the more so based on the results of the study here, which show that the language of the arbitration clause is harder to understand than the rest of the language written in the contract, suggesting that consumers may not even, if they do know uh, that there's an arbitration clause, they may not even understand uh, its implications. Um, we've heard a lot of discussion about, some, or some discussion about various ways in which arbitration clauses may be unfair, arbitration procedures are secret, um, uh, there's, there may be a repeat player uh, bias, but I think another reason to be concerned is that uh, corporations' own behavior, the, the corporations that draft the arbitration clauses, show that they are also concerned about it. There is some data that suggests if you look at uh, arbitration clauses between a company and another company, ones that are negotiated at arm's length that are not on a take-it-or-leave-it basis, that suggests that the arbitration clauses are much less common in those contracts than they are in contracts with consumers, uh, suggesting that when they have a chance to negotiate about it, they don't actually want to use uh, arbitration. Or the class action bans that are in arbitration clauses are written in a way to be non-severable, so that if the class action ban is declared unenforceable, the whole arbitration clause goes away. And what that suggests to me is that uh, companies like arbitration clauses, when they keep claims from being res uh, disputes from being resolved at all, but if the dispute is going to be heard, they want it to be heard in court, not in arbitration, because they, companies are concerned about the limited procedural protections, the limited judicial review of arbitration. And so if they lose the class action ban and there's going to be a class action, they want it in court, not in arbitration. Okay. In a word, yes. In, in 2009, a public citizen, um, we did a survey of consumers um, on related to forced arbitration, gave them the two, gave them the what I'll call the, the big business arguments for arbitration and also the, the consumer arguments. And consumers across the political spectrum, um, across all colors, across econo economics, they, they all, the, not, well, the majority, the majority of, of these consumers did not um, uh, favor forced arbitration. They opposed it. And 
the most uh, troubling thing about uh, that survey was that was that most of these consumers did not know that that their their basic just just a basic constitutional right it's basic like the first amendment everybody knows what the first amendment is it's the seventh amendment everybody knows that they have a basic constitutional right to to a civil jury, jury trial and i think if you were to step out onto the street and and, and ask just a random person w whether they knew that the that corporations can just have there's this dense um, information in a contract that says they cannot pursue claims in court i think i think they would be shocked and should they be concerned? Yes, they should be concerned. But the, but because they don't know, the most consumers are just not aware. They would be concerned. I, it's it's not really a matter of should. I think they just would be concerned if they were aware of it. Thanks, uh, thanks Christine. I, I'm going to turn it back to uh, to Shannon. We've heard a lot about arbitration generally this morning. Uh, in your view, are there particular markets or products where arbitration clauses are particularly helpful to consumers or to companies? Actually, I don't think there's any particular markets or, or products. I, th I think really the focus should be on uh, the relief and the process for, for getting that relief rather than the, on the underlying market or product because I, I believe that regardless of the market or product, once you get past that and you get into the, into the, the seeking of relief, then it, it, it really doesn't matter what market or product you're looking at for the consumer to go to um, or, or for the consumer or the, the um, company to go to, into arbitration to get this settled. Now, I, I represent community banks, and they don't particularly use these clauses. However, they would like to have the opportunity to use them when they're necessary. And they, they, their biggest concern is that not having the ability to have an arbitration clause when it's necessary is going to increase their costs, and their margins are very slim as they are. We've seen a lot of consolidation in the industry just because of that fact, because of over-regulation, uh, and we've had a, a, gotten caught in the backwash of an overreaction of the bad acts of the larger banks and the non-banks in the mortgage industry, and we don't want to see that happen here. We are very concerned about the consumer, and I, I believe that you'll find that with the community banks, when they do use arbitration clauses, that in the most, for the most part, their attorneys have been very thoughtful in drafting those clauses to where they are readable, and they draft those clauses where they're not arbitrary, they're not capricious, they're not uh, taking away anybody's constitutional rights. For the most part, when you go into a community bank, you know that community banker, and you're gonna worship with that community banker, you're gonna go to the grocery store with that community banker, and they don't want to treat you any differently than they would want to treat their, their mother, their brother, their sister, or their spouse. So having said that, if you take away the uh, ability to arbitrate when it's necessary, what's going to happen is, is that you're going to take those thin profit margins and make them even thinner, make it more difficult to, to have choice in, in communities. And I can tell you right now, as we do have consolidation, we actually have some communities in Texas that have no banks. No banks are going to loan them money on, on, on mortgages. I can take you to a community in Texas where you cannot get a mortgage loan. The banker told me, I will not take a mortgage on your house. And I know I'm kind of getting a little bit off topic. I will not take a mortgage on your house. I will make you, I will make you a loan. Take a mortgage. I'll take a lien on your pickup truck, and you can buy a house with that. And, and my, so my concern is, as we continue to put another straw on the camel's back on the community banks, one more straw being taking away the ability to, to arbitrate. I think there is a middle ground. I think that you don't look at the bad actors and do away with arbitration clauses. I think what you do is you, you look at the bad actors, and you do like the Supreme Court did in Concepcion, or take some reasonable act as, as, as CFPB might do, preserve the ability to arbitrate, but preserve it fairly. Ellen, this question is to you. Have you seen major changes in the way that arbitration provisions have been used over the last um, three years? Yeah, I, 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 there's definitely been a change in the last three years, um, and this is largely due to the major Supreme Court decisions that have been issued. Uh, we've, uh, Director Cordray uh, mentioned his, in his opening statement when he uh, referred to, you know, prior to 2010, the Supreme Court had a more restricted uh, view of arbitration, but uh, since then, 
they've grossly uh, expanded um, how they view and interpret arbitration clauses and the, the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, basically, what they've done is they've overruled consumer case law and uh, that have attended, uh, intended to protect consumers. Uh, we've seen this in uh, Renner Center versus Jackson, which is a Supreme Court case that ruled that challenges to forced arbitration clauses uh, we brought are decided not by the courts, but by arbitrators. So the example that I gave in my opening statement about Ms. Duran, who lives in, in New York, um, now after Renner Center, uh, what happened was that this, this, this Second Circuit decided that uh, her, her only remedy was to actually go to New York and go in front of the arbitrator and prove that her case is unconscionable and unfair. And she actually has to travel to New York to do this, to prove that it's unfair to be in New York. Uh, it, and so these types of clauses, they didn't occur prior uh, to Runner Center. Um, and again, as it's Concepcion uh, has been mentioned earlier, um, basically eviscerating the use of, of class actions and uh, the con a consumer's ability to, to band together uh, on these small claims, these complicated cases that, that wouldn't be, be brought otherwise unless they could be brought through a class action. And what Concepcion has done is it's taken um, consumers' rights uh, away from them and they're no longer able to hold uh, wrongdoers accountable. Uh, and that we've seen um, in previous studies that over 100 uh, cases that, that would have been uh, brought through class action were dismissed uh, because of Concepcion, and I'm sure there's even more uh, than that today. Um, and then and in, in uh, the CFPB's, in your study, uh, you've brought to light that only 300 uh, cases have been uh, brought individually uh, each year since 2010, and we believe that's a, a direct result of, of uh, Concepcion. Um, also, We've seen in Compu uh, versus Greenwood, which is another Supreme Court case, um, basically saying that uh, if a federal statute doesn't explicitly state that the congressional intent in the statute is to override the Federal Arbitration Act, um, the arbitration clause will be upheld. Uh, so what I mentioned before when I was talking about uh, our, a service member um, that was uh, wrongfully foreclosed upon and his his. Uh, rights were violated under the Service Member Civil Relief Act, and he was a remedy um, in that act to go to the court of law. And because of his arbitration clause, and because the Service Member Civil Relief Act doesn't explicitly say that um, you can't, uh, that doesn't override the, the Federal Arbitration Act, then that service member wasn't able to use this SCRA properly. And so that's a clear example of how consumer laws have been eviscerated uh, due to uh, the Supreme Court cases. And then uh, finally, most recently in, in American Express versus in Italian Colors, um, it basically said that small businesses and consumers, if even when they can uh, show that they can't effectively vindicate their rights, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It, uh, they still uh, have to go through arbitration, and they can't use um, the system of of joining together in a class uh, when it's. Uh, even if it's saying that they, they, they can't use their rights to do so. So as a consequence of these, these decisions, there, in the past, uh, really just the past three years, thousands of, of claims have gone unheard. Um, and as the CFPB study shows, it's not just in a court of law, it's, it's in arbitration anywhere. They're just not being brought. Um, Jess, I'm going to uh, direct my question to you. Today's uh, release of preliminary study results focused on arbitration filings from 2010 onwards. There have been many developments in the law, as we've just heard Ellen describe some of them. Um, could you comment on uh, trends or evolution that you're seeing in the use of arbitration clauses? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks for the, uh, for the question, Meredith. Uh, uh, I guess there, there's a, there, there are a number of uh, developments. I guess maybe I'll focus on on, on just a couple. Um, I, well, let me. I'll, I'll give you more than just a couple. I think increasingly you're seeing um, situations where uh, arbitration clauses uh, have more consumer-friendly characteristics. There are obviously there have been concerns about venues. More and more uh, consumers are able to. Uh, uh, go to arbitration w with written submissions or telephonically, um, and, and to, to cost, more and more companies are uh, shouldering most, if not all, in fact, uh, usually all the, the, the cost of going to arbitration. 
Um, just a couple more that are probably even a little more new. I'd say those are those were out there, but they're sort of increasing in uh, their 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 reach. Uh, but I'd also say too that are they're a little bit more new. Um, increasingly, you see things like uh, minimum recoveries uh, and even bonus payments. And a bonus payment, think of it this way: if you know, even even a company that has an arbitration clause has an incentive not to go to arbitration or you know not to take it all the way to arbitration. As I said in my remarks, uh, everybody you know, c companies want to resolve these uh, disputes uh, as quickly and as efficiently as they can, and they even create an incentive for themselves to do it. Um, if you go to arbitration. Uh, and the award you're given by the arbitrator as a consumer or as the customer uh, is in excess of the last sort of best settlement offer that was made by the company, then the consumer in a lot of cases where this is a feature of that arbitration clause gets a bonus. It's a way even to, for companies to incentivize themselves to be sure that they're <coughs> making fair offers uh, up front. So those are a couple things that are new. And I, and I also think that increasingly we're seeing more arbitration. Um, and I, I know that one, one of the findings of the, the study is, uh, to, to paraphrase, that you know, relatively few uh, arbitrations. But I think uh, as we go down the road here and begin and continue to look back, I think we'll see that there's uh, more that we'll see more arbitration. And I think even arbitrations that begin to look like uh, classes in a way, um, uh, there, there are ways to pool uh, resources and the cost of, 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 of arbitrating in a way that allows sort of multi-member participants in arbitration. So I think we'll see more and more of that as well. Great, thank you. Sure. Christine, are, are there markets where you see the challenges posed by arbitration clauses be more or less significant to consumers? And if so, can you talk a little bit about why that might be the case? Sure. I wanted to uh, mention that the, the CFPB authority to eliminate forced arbitration is, is not unprecedented. These clauses have been banned before in, in other contexts because of because of their unfairness, um, such as with um, the Military Lending Act, which which protects some service members um, from certain lending products, and with auto dealers being protected. Congress protected auto dealers from from the big bad auto manufacturers, banned forced arbitration. Auto dealers asked Congress to do that and it did. So so those are those are two businesses. So and 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 what Congress did was level the playing field between the franchise small business auto dealers and the large multinational manufacturers to level the playing field to al allow auto dealers to go to court against bigger manufacturers. So what we have here now is um, is the same thing. We we have consumers who need to have to, we need a level playing field as well. So in terms of the markets, what we have are CFPB regulated products and services. Most of them involve a standard form contract to obtain you know debt relief, auto financing, banking, payday loans, credit cards, student loans, and any other financial services. They they all involve a standard form contract, and most of these. Um, most of these products also leave consumers vulnerable to to things such as um, interest rate, large usurious interest rate uh, charges, illegal fees, unfair and deceptive acts and practices. So, their consumers are vulnerable to, to to these this kind of conduct. So, in all uh, all across the market, all across all of those markets that I listed and more. So. What we have here now is that we ha we need a rule to ban arbitration across the entire market because we are right now millions of us consumers are we just are being denied legal remedies at, at the most critical times. Thank you. Um, this one's uh, to to Wooly uh, industry panelists. Scott, maybe we'll start with you. Um, it seems, and this is something that we talked about in the study some, that at least in some markets, not every industry player uses an arbitration clause. What do you see as the costs and benefits to industry from the use of such clauses? Is that different for different players? It, it may be. Um, I can say um, the experience in AFSA is most of our members do have arbitration clauses in their contracts. Uh, but there's reasons for that. Um, there are some statements that have been made today about the complexity of an arbitration clause. Imagine what it would look like if we were required to provide the guidance and instruction on how to file a lawsuit in our contract. 
I'd venture to guess that would be a bit more complex than the arbitration language that is in there. Um, there is arbitration in there. The, the reason why, one of the reasons is, is because it enables the bank, uh, the finance company, to maintain as best as possible its value and purpose in creating and maintaining customer loyalty. Um, an arbitration plot process generally allows for continuing dialogue between the finance company and its customer. And I can tell you that AFSA is dedicated to maintaining customer loyalty. Banks and, and finance uh, industry uh, entities and companies want to maintain loyalty with their customers. They're not interested in making enemies of their customers. They want to keep them. Arbitration is a good way to do that because it enables a dialogue to continue. And in our experience, quite often in the arbitration process, because you are generally maintaining a dialogue with that customer, the dispute gets resolved prior to the actual hearing. And the customer is entirely satisfied, and the finance institution is entirely satisfied. Where in our perception, um, it would be interesting if the CFPB can, can engage part of its study to determine to what extent or level of uh, litigation that is filed against the finance sector is customer driven versus attorney driven. We do believe that there is a healthy amount of litigation that is filed by attorneys and driven by attorneys and not based on or concerning the individual consumer's rights. And that's one of the reasons why there is a concern or a prohibition on the filing of a class action that's part of the arbitration clause. I, I think that there might be some sort of subtext that people have that class actions are a good thing. Maybe sometimes they are, but a lot of the times they are not. And I'd venture to guess that class actions are probably the most abused litigation process in this country. More often than not, the class actions that I have been privy to have ended up dismissed, but only after the bank or finance institution had to incur a substantial amount of time and money to do so. Because the arbitration clause has many values as far as maintaining the dialogue, enabling the customer to get what they want as far as the immediate relief and it enables the finance institution to continue to maintain that customer and get that customer's loyalty, there's definite value in it. Just. Sure. Um, I can probably keep this short. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, first of all, uh, arbitration clauses and arbitration uh, sort of systems uh, uh, aren't free. They, so they impose a cost on a company. A company takes on a uh, pretty substantial cost, particularly the, the better arbitration clauses, the more consumer friendly, the more it costs the company to, to have that system. Um, and so not everybody may able, not every company may be able to shoulder those costs. So I think that may be one thing. Now, of course, they get, companies get something for this, right? I mean, it's, uh, th there's, there's no, uh, you know, th what they get is a more predictable, more efficient way of engaging with their customers and resolving disputes that doesn't require sort of you know, the endless, uh, 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 you know, sort of getting endlessly bogged down in the court system through one venue or another. It doesn't sound like a lot of people are using small claims court, so we're going straight up the middle and just sort of litigating on your own has its own uh, challenges. And I think, uh, again, I've mentioned some of the challenges of class actions, not just for consumers, but obviously, as Scott said, the burden on companies is enormous. So the trade off, I think, for most companies is we want to do right by our customers. We think we will set up a consumer-friendly uh, arbitration process to do so, even though it costs us a bunch of money to do it, because we know we're avoiding a substantial transaction uh, cost through litigation by doing so. Um, so I think that's sort of the, the calculation I assume people are making, and I, 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 I can assume, I, can, I could probably make up reasons why, why it would make sense in one industry or one size versus another, but I think that's probably the, the overall calculation. Thanks. Jim? Arbitration, in my, in my mind, provides consumers with an effective and means for dispute resolution. It's, it's cheaper than litigation. To say that arbitration is more complicated or harder to understand than litigation just means you've never been in a litigation. Um, I, it, it's also quicker. I've been following a case that's very important to us that was filed in 2003. It is now at the Texas Supreme Court, and we still don't have a final decision. That's 10 years. I can tell you that arbitration is much quicker than that. And when you, when you move more quickly, you also save money. There's no doubt about it. The 
largest institutions in the United States certainly understand the justice system and they know how to employ the justice system. They don't have a problem employing the justice system and they don't have a problem outmanning consumers with, with lawyers in the justice system. I think arbitration sort of levels that bar a little bit so that you're not going in there against the large New York law firm. And I will say that our community banks, if they do have arbitration clauses, they will never have the venue in New York City. I promise that. <laughs> uh, just to go on a little bit, I, I, as, a, as a personal note, I received a check from a class action a, a few days ago, and I'd like to today renounce, announce my retirement. I have, it, I have it taped to my door. I think the tape that I used cost me more than the, than the check. It was for 39 cents. I think everybody in this room knows who made the money off that. And it, it certainly was not the consumer, apparently, which I was one that did not opt out. Uh, the bank didn't make money because it's going to cost them a lot more than 39 cents to process that check, and I'm tempted to just go ahead and send it through just so they, so they get to have that expense. Um, the lawyers, we know, they're, they're the ones that made the money in this case. And the issue that I have here is that we're talking about financial services, and there's no industry that's more regulated than the financial institutions. The community banks are just as regulated as Bank of America, Chase, Citigroup, any of the above. We don't need class actions. We have regulators that can take care of these things. You've got a sign missing on an ATM machine. Well, of course, they're not required now, but if you had one, you go to the regulator. They'll take care of it. You've got an ADA complaint against an AD, a, a ATM machine because maybe it doesn't have the Braille, it doesn't have the spoken language. The regulator can take care of that. An arbitration clause can also be, be useful. Also, when, when you're talking about community banks, you're talking about products that are probably specifically tailored to your needs. You sit down and you talk to somebody you know, you probably went to grade school with them, and you knew their family, and they're tailoring a product. It's not even a product that's gonna be susceptible to a class action anyway, because the person that comes in after you is not gonna get that same product. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to the question of remedy and redress. Um, Richard, could you speak to uh, whether the presence of arbitration clauses and consumer contracts has impacted the consumer's ability to seek redress? Thank you, Meredith. Um, I think it has um, in, a, in a number of ways. Um, uh, there have been some suggestions that consumers, uh, when they get to arbitration, may or may not do as well as they would in court. But I think one of the bigger problems with arbitration clauses is that it prevents, is that the con you have to look at the consumers who can't access, who are signed arbitration clauses and can't access the arbitration system at all. Um, and have no avenue for seeking relief. And I think the, the example, I, there's a lot of ways in which this happens, but the example I want to focus on, I think, because it seems to be, based on the study, the most prevalent term um, in, in arbitration contracts is the ban on seeking any form of, of collective relief. Um, and I think that the reason why this is troubling is because um, a lot of corporate wrongdoing, particularly, I think, in financial services, involves um, cheating individuals about out of out of relatively small amounts uh, of money you know significant I think for the individual uh, but small on the grand scale but doing that across everybody across thousands or sometimes even millions of people so that uh, a company can reap millions of dollars in an uh, ill-gotten profits um, but the only remedy for those kinds of claims is going to be a collective action because as uh, the the study here shows um, individuals are not going to bring arbitrations for less than $1,000. They're not going to go to small claims court uh, for less uh, uh, than $1,000. Um, and there, there have been some suggest there have been some suggestions about the value of class actions in providing relief. People don't see claims and other things. But I think that's also directly refuted by the information in this report, which identifies several class actions um, involving against payday lenders in which, dam in which uh, the, they settled for a significant amount of money, and the settlement payouts were given to every single class member without requiring them to submit uh, a claim. Um, so I think that, uh, that undermines, I think, that, that, is, that assertion right there. There's also been um, a suggestion about model, uh, the model arbitration clause that um, uh, Shannon uh, mentioned from AT&T versus Concepcion, um, and that's mentioned, you know, sort of bonus payments or things like that. But the, 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 the development of that arbitration clause is actually very interesting. It was the advice of the attorney uh, to include all those bells and whistles in that, in that arbitration clause as a way of protecting the class action ban. The idea being 
It doesn't matter how much other stuff you promise in the arbitration clause, because if you have the class action ban, no one's ever going to be able to bring the claim. So do whatever you can to insulate that arbitration clause from challenge. Promise whatever you want, because if that class action ban exists, no claim is going to get brought. So I think that that example actually um, uh, is very telling uh, uh, in that regard. I think class actions are very valuable, or other forms of collective action. It's not just class actions that are banned. Um, they are very important ways for getting uh, consumers relief. They're very important ways for changing business practices, even in cases where consumers get small relief, and that and that and that uh, benefit spreads out to the entire community. Um, and I think that that. That universal ban on, on class actions is there for a reason, and uh, it's not a good reason when it comes to consumer uh, consumer protection. Thanks, Scott. You've already um, identified some of these factors, but if you could speak a little further about uh, the factors that play into a decision by a company to use an arbitration clause in consumer contracts, and are those factors different across contracts? Um, I don't think so. Um, the, the value, as I said before, about arbitration clauses is uh, there's many. Um, you know, as I talked about the right to build customer loyalty, um, I talked about the economics of it, and it's something that I, I should also comment on. Uh, recently, um, and I'm, the CFPB, I'm sure, is aware, and, and there uh, maybe some people here are aware, there have been challenges uh, judicially to the use of arbitration clauses, and uh, um, it's under review right now uh, from uh, some appellate courts. Um, but one of the things that is looked at in whether or not the arbitration clause is fair is to what extent does it provide fairness to the consumer. Um, I do know that in AFSA, uh, there are a lot of efforts being taken to make the arbitration clause more fair to consumers, including terms that require the bank or finance entity to provide reimbursement to the consumer for their arbitration cost. Sometimes it's partial, sometimes it could be the entire amount. Additionally, there are bars in the arbitration clauses to the bank or finance company's ability to appeal the decision, not so for the consumer. These are things that the industry is doing to make the arbitration clause more user friendly and fairer to consumers who may feel that it doesn't really help them. Um, in a way, the arbitration clause is included in the contract to allow the customer to have a place to go if they have a dispute, as opposed to wondering what to do and uh, going to a law firm perhaps or trying to figure out what their rights are. Um, regarding the ability or any data that might indicate that arbitration clauses are not used for small amounts of money, well, that may change um, if the industry continues along, as I've suggested, with providing reimbursements. That tend, it seems to be a going trend uh, to reimburse the consumer for their cost of expense in bringing it. That would encourage consumers to bring arbitration for smaller amounts of money. And as we've already spoken uh, before, um, there, it's um, generally uh, the arbitration is conducted in uh, a place that is convenient to the consumer. And unlike the judicial system, uh, the consumer has a say in the choice of arbitrator. Uh, the selection of the arbitrator is a process in, in the entire function in which the consumer has the right to have their voice heard. Not necessarily so in the judicial system, where most of the time you have to basically be heard by the judge that is assigned to your case. So there are some definite advantages to arbitration. And while I can't speak for every company as far as their decision to use arbitration clauses, um, the majority of the members of uh, AFSA do use them and have considered it very consumer friendly and very helpful in the industry. I think I have the, uh, the wrap-up question that, that goes to everybody, um, uh, which is what you think are the most significant issues relating to arbitration clauses and arbitration that the Bureau should prioritize in its study moving forward. Jess, why don't I start with you? I, I know you've got some views in this response. Sure, yeah, and you probably know where I'm going to go with this because I, I've, I've alluded to it in uh, a couple of the responses to my questions and my opening remarks. And let me also just say that, you know, I'm, I'm hardened by uh, what I heard uh, you say, Director Cordray, at the top and, and in uh, some of the uh, some of what I saw, I haven't had a chance to read all 170 pages of the preliminary findings, but uh, I, I did find uh, the, the section again that confirms 
uh, as the director said, that you will be looking into sort of the, the contextual question. Um, what happens if arbitration goes away? What, you know, where are consumers forced to go to find, to get redress? And uh, as best we can tell with the data available, how good of a job do those, does the court system, do, do class actions do um, in obtaining uh, relief for consumers? And again, we're talking about small individualized claims here for the most part. Um, and, and again, I think based on what we've found in our, in our, in our own research that it's going to be very, very difficult um, to say that consumers are better off facing the courts rather than going through arbitration, uh, particularly in situations where they're being reimbursed for the entire cost of, of the process, where they have a choice of the arbitrator. Again, for the most part, the, the, the arbitration process is, is fast, it's cheap if not totally free, um, and you're going to get a result quickly and, prob and chances are one that's in your favor. You know, does it make sense? to throw that away in favor of and sort of hope that the class actions you know, process is going to change and yield better results for, for consumers. So I really do think, you know, I, I think what you've done to date makes sense to sort of scope out uh, the use of consumer uh, 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 or arbitration contracts in the consumer context. And again, I think there's probably some more context that could be given about why so few have been brought to arbitration. We're happy to provide more comments there. But I think this next uh, slug of the study, the next portion of the study is very, very important in putting the first part in context. Because again, at the end of the day, the goal should be the best result for the consumer. And I think we need to be sort of tackle this eyes wide open, understanding what the relative benefits are of each dispute resolution process. Thanks. John? I believe that um, one of the problems might be misunderstanding of, of you're talking about folks with a disputes of under $1,000 aren't using arbitration. I think maybe there's a a lack of understanding or not, or there's not enough knowledge out there about what arbitration is. Possibly there's also some work that could be done on the arbitration process itself to make it better for those smaller claims, because I think that's exactly the kind of claims that this, this works for. Because I, I know if you go to an attorney, when I was in private practice, if you came to me with a, a, a thousand dollar or less claim, I probably couldn't take it. It's not that I didn't want to take it, I probably couldn't take it. Because honestly, you have to make, a lawyer has to make money. You, they're not in business to, to, at the end of the year, look at how much they've lost. Uh, their, their spouses are probably going to be real happy with a, with a business plan like that. So I, in a lot of cases, it's not, again, it's not a choice between going to court or going, going into arbitration unless you want to go to small claims court and take, take on your, your, own, your own case, which, of course, that is, that is available also. And maybe there's some education there that needs, that needs to be done there, too, about, about the use of small claims court. I think as far as the... the clauses themselves. I think the biggest issue is grammar. I think that they could be written better. I know we as lawyers tend to, to write things in, in hieroglyphics that are difficult to read. They're sometimes difficult for us to read. They're often much longer than they need to be. You could go through and scratch out about half of it and still have the same result. So I, I, I think that that's an issue too. And then of course visibility. They need to be very visible in the contracts where folks can see. And I, I'm not sitting on this side totally opposite of your side. I, I'm wanting to be able to to work with the consumer groups to get these to get these arbitration clauses to be fair and useful to them uh, i do think they are in a lot of cases um, i hope the cfpb at least at some point maybe finds an arbitration case that they can go through and sit alongside of and follow it all the way through to see see exactly how it works let me let me turn it over this way for a bit uh, christine sure so well just in a quick response um so the CFPB rule, well, the anticipated and the hope for CFPB rule on, on forced arbitration um, would not eliminate arbitration. Arbitration will still exist. It will be voluntary. It will be voluntary for after the dispute arises. It will still exist. The AAA will still exist. And businesses can, after the dispute arises, and businesses and consumers can still agree if it's in both their interests to go to arbitration. So um, in terms of some of the, the issues, I think I, we have a mountain of evidence. There's, I, we believe that there's a mountain of evidence already th that there, that arbitration, forced arbitration, forced arbitration is unfair. But um, I, we think that the, the CFUB should uh, consider um, or continue the, the suppression of claims 
um, um, data, the collection of data that is showing that there is a suppression of claims. We think that uh, you know the CFPB uh, concluded that 90% of companies with arbitration clauses also have class action bans. That's not a coincidence. So I think that that's I think that that is a, a really um, wherever the CFPB decides to go next in, in that um, area uh, would be helpful. I think one issue we did not discuss today what is the impact uh, on injunctive relief. I think injunctive relief is when um, uh, a consumer files a case in, in court and, and asks the judge um, to, to stop a, a, a bad practice of an industry, maybe of a company, whether it's deceptive uh, practices or deceptive marketing or whatever the case, illegal fees, whatever the case may be, um, the, the, I think a really powerful tool that the consumer has is to go to court and act on behalf of the public, act on the, behalf of the public to say, stop this, stop this practice, and, and that, just, that doesn't just help that one consumer, it helps everyone, all of the customers of that company. So I, I think that that's um, possibly an area uh, for the CFPB to, to look at. Um, there is a, I also think that state consumer protection laws um, have been impacted by forced arbitration and class action bans. Maybe the CFPB would like to to uh, look look at that impact a, a little bit more. I mean, these state there are, all of the states have laws, the unfair, deceptive acts and practices laws. They're they're very useful. Um, but what I um, I've found that state AGs are um, can't enforce can't enforce um, the, these laws on their own. So. What the, the state legislators did was include a provision in those state UDAP laws giving consumers a private right of action. So they're saying, we have this law that would, would uh, protect you from unfair deceptive acts and practices. We can't, the state cannot handle it on our own. We need consumers to act on their own behalf, act on their own, and which is a, a wonderful uh, free market principle. Acting on their own to go to court and and so these what happens is it's possible that the the, the that the class action bans are are having an impact on their ability to do that. So those are. Thank you, Christine. Richard. Um, uh, I know it's I know it's time for public comment, so I'll try and okay. uh, keep it quick. But I think one interesting thing might be to look at um, uh, it, financial services companies. Uh, what their contracts look like with other entities as opposed to contracts with consumers. Do they use arbitration clauses in those contracts? What do those arbitration clauses look like? Um, and is their behavior different when they have a chance to negotiate versus when they can dictate terms to uh, consumers? Um, there's been a suggestion that arbitration clauses save money uh, for companies. So um, it'd be interesting to study whether this, these savings, if they are there, do they pass on to consumers? Where places where class action bans are enforced? Are there lower interest rates for consumers? Are there higher where class action bans are not enforced? Has there been a change in rates since uh, the Supreme Court said that class action bans uh, could be enforced? I think that would be um, a worthy subject. Um, and the last thing, quickly, I think looking at the history of, of class action arbitrations as opposed to um, just class actions in court, um, the AAA allowed for class action arbitrations. And we, we hear a lot of discussion about class actions in court versus arbitration, um, but the arbitration clauses don't just prohibit class actions in court, they also prohibit class arbitration. So what was the process like for that? Was it a worthwhile process? Were people satisfied? And whether that could be uh, a, an alternative? Thanks. Um, Scott, and then maybe Ellen okay. Mosswood. Uh, the question is what? <laughs> she hasn't had a chance to talk to this question. Oh. I'm sorry. Do you want me to go ahead? Or? Sure. You okay. Go first. <laughs> well, uh, I you know I agree with uh, both of my colleagues, but I I have to say that I I think that there's enough evidence out there, and especially around the suppression of consumer claims. I think that um, what you provided with your study and other previous research research and studies has shown that. Um, arbitration clauses are, are suppressing consumer claims and that um, the, the, the Bureau has uh, the authority to issue rulemaking now. <laughs> I think that it's, in, um, it's, it's urgent that they act now. I think that what you've, what you've seen in the, in the past few years is that consumers aren't uh, going to court or, or arbitration and um, that they're losing their rights. I think what, which, which was mentioned earlier, the idea of um, 
regulating around the arbitration process is just not going to work. We've seen this in other industries you, um, that uh, abusive companies, particularly ones that are writing the contracts and writing the provisions, uh, they're always going to find a way around the system. They're always going to they're going to continue to to rig the game, and though we can't we can't uh, regulate uh, in that way, and that the we think. Um, that the only clear solution is to ban forced, arbit forced arbitration, as, as Christine mentioned, uh, clauses now. Thanks very much. Scott, last word on what our priorities should be for the rest of the study? I, I think I'm prepared now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think one of the priorities should be, as, as I mentioned in my opening statement, is to, um, I think the, the CFPB should check and interview customers who went through the arbitration process. Because I think a lot has, has been said, I think there's some perceptions that arbitration is too complex, that it's a bad thing, that the rights aren't heard. I, I think if you have the data that you can get it through the AAA, I think part of your study should be checking with those people to see how it worked for them. Um, what, was it valuable to them? A and then as far as whether or not people actually use the arbitration clause, I think that could be an education issue. And that's something that I already stated uh, AFSA is committed to, uh, education is something that we acknowledge is necessary uh, in the banking finance industry, not only for the arbitration clause, but to make certain people understand the finance obligation that they're undertaking. And it's a, 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 a procedure and it's a, an initiative that AFSA is involved in anyway. So if a finding comes out of this that, you know, as CFPB recommends, the industry undertake greater education levels to inform consumers of the use of arbitration and what it does and the benefits of it, that's something we would heartedly agree with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, before we uh, open up this discussion to the audience, I just want to say thank you to all of you. We have been extremely fortunate to have had your participation and to have heard your comments and your examples and your ideas. So thank you. And I ask the audience to uh, join me in thanking our participants. So our panelists are going to return to the audience and um, how the audience portion of this is going to work. Thank you, Meredith. Now it's time to hear from audience participants here today. And a number of you have signed up to share comments and observations about today's discussion and more importantly, to share your comments, your feedback about what you're seeing in your communities, what's happening in consumer finance markets, where you live, where you work. Uh, each person who signed up to provide testimony will have two minutes to do so. And what we hear from you is invaluable to us. We take this back with us. It teaches us further about how we should think about things and how we should move forward. So with that said, I would encourage you to stick to the two minute limit so that we can hear from every single person who signed up. And our first audience participant is Reverend Dr. Frederick Haynes. Either Kelvin or Bruce will bring you a microphone. There you go. OK, thank you so much. Again, let me express my appreciation to you for uh, bringing uh, this information and your concern to Dallas, uh, especially given the fact that this is the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, my concern and from my community has everything to do with protection for a community uh, that has been targeted and is under attack uh, by economic predators, i.e. payday loan, car title loan, uh, companies, et cetera. And so our communities uh, are inundated, they are proliferated, they are targeted uh, by these institutions because, as we've discussed earlier, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are in a banking desert, and so I'm hoping uh, that the CFPB will come back uh, to Dallas specifically to deal with this due to the fact that uh, there are more, what, payday and car title loan stores in Texas than you have Burger King, McDonald's, you've heard that story. And so I'm asking you to please come back uh, to discuss with us 
a couple of things. Number one, regulations, what we can do to better regulate an industry uh, that is rooted in greed and attacking people who are desperate and find themselves in situations where they are basically underbanked. And then number two, resources uh, for these communities that again suffer from a banking, being in a banking desert. And so I hope that you will come back and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Reverend Haynes, and thank you for the invitation. Jennifer Allman. Hi, I'm Jennifer Allman, and I work for the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Catholic Bishops of Texas. They have significant concerns about the practices of the payday and auto title lending industry in our communities. These concerns come from both our moral concern over the issue of usury, but, but more dramatically over the practical experience we see in the communities we serve throughout the state of Texas. We did a survey in 2010 and in 2012. We found that more than, thir more than a third of our clients receiving charitable assistance are currently paying out auto, auto title and payday loans. For example, when we provide $300 of assistance to an average family for a month's worth of, worth of utility and, and food, um, needs, they're paying $450 that same month to the payday lender. And so it's raised a significant concern for us. As a result of that concern, we have um, begun a series of listening sessions around the state, canvassing the state with nonprofit partners, talking directly with clients in need, as well as case managers about their experiences with payday and auto title lending. I know that today's topic is on arbitration, so I'm going to share just one or two short um, examples of times in which this arbitration clause has created a significant problem for our clients. In one example, a gentleman had a car title loan, a truck on his truck. He went to the lender that in the middle of that week and told him on Friday he would be moving into a homeless shelter so that he could afford to pay off the loan when he got his paycheck on Monday, and that he would be back to the lender on Monday with payment. The lender showed up to repossess his truck on Friday when it was full of all of his personal belongings that were going to a storage unit. He got an attorney, because he made the payment on Monday, he got an attorney to represent him and he was able to get his truck back, but the contract had explicitly in it that any possessions found in the vehicle would be the property of the lender after repossession. And so the lender kept all of his possessions. There was an arbitration clause in the contract, so he couldn't really pursue it any further. In another example, we had a lender in the same homeless shelter. Um, the, the caseworkers were sharing these stories with us. They had the lender actually call the homeless shelter and say to them, can you come pick up this woman? We've just repossessed her car and she was living in it. So the examples that we've seen of unscrupulous businesses practices throughout the community are having a direct impact on people's lives and on the charity that we attempt to provide them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holman. Janet Amab. Thank you very much for this opportunity. One of the things that has been missing in this discussion is home building. And it's extremely important because the biggest mortgage, biggest problem we have is a mortgage as well. Um, and, and let me just give a little bit of background. I'm, I'm with Homeowners for Better Building. I'm sorry I didn't say that. We're a national organization. Um, and we're based in San Antonio. And the, Back in 1996, there was a joint venture, 94, there was a joint venture formed by the American Arbitration Association, National Association of Home Builders. It published uh, their changes, and then that, uh, in the changes to the American arbitration construction industry, arbitration rules in 1996, they adopted them. It states, in June 1994, AAA created the Construction ADR Task Force comprised of 55 representatives of the construction industry and their advocates with the goals of, and one of them was to write the rules. And it ended in the last portion of that two-sentence paragraph, it said, with a, the goal of improving AAA services and helping the AA be more responsible, more responsive to the needs of the construction industry. That's outrageous. 
Um, then the National Association of Home Builders promulgated a contract with binding arbitration in it, stating that all would be arbitrated through the American Arbitration Association under the arbitration rules. Since then, home building has gone down. In, uh, an example of that is that the rush to greed, the mortgage fraud that went on, conspicuously absent, although they created a, a large number of the mortgage fraud loans, where the home was a home building industry. They say the same thing that was said today regarding they have to protect their, rep their reputation so they'll take care of homeowners. Nothing could be further than from the truth when homeowners are forced into binding arbitration that is behind closed doors, not public. If, if they wanted to take care of them, they wouldn't care and they wouldn't have to make this all big secret. Mr. It's Hobbs, not thank a public you so record. Much for your comments, we'd be happy to take the entirety of your statement for the transcript. Okay. And, and well, my suggestion is let's put the big equation into this, and I certainly do appreciate this opportunity. Thank you thank for you your comments, much. Professor Mary Spector. Thank you. I'm from the SMU Dedman School of Law, where I run a clinic for low-income clients. <clears throat> the mic on yes. and also teach consumer law I wanted to follow up on um, two things that were said one was from Professor Frankel who talked about the way that um, consumer protection laws at the state and at the federal level many have provisions that pre-dispute arbitration clauses eliminate for example the class action is one of them because of the recognition that small disputes cannot be economically um, resolved one at a time, and that the, um, the enforcement mechanism of the class action is critical to the, to the effectiveness of the consumer protection provision. So that was one point. Um, and also, the, the second point, which is very similar, is that other remedies, remedies such as injunctive relief, punitive damages, are all parts of thoughtful, comprehensive consumer protection regulatory schemes. <clears throat> and in an arbitration clause that eliminates some of those provisions, you're eliminating the effect effectiveness of the consumer protection scheme itself. I'd also like to join the first speaker um, in um, inviting you back to Dallas. Um, my areas are debt collection and credit reporting, and we have a lot to talk about on those areas as well. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> Jeff Johnson. My name is Jeff Johnson. I'm senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Commerce, Texas. I'm also president of the Baptist General Convention of Texas so that represents over 5,000 churches here in the state of Texas. My background is a bivocational minister with a Bachelor of Business Administration from Texas A&M with an emphasis in money and banking, and I worked for several years as a financial analyst. Uh, prior to that, uh, prior to being a compliance officer, I worked in debt reduction strategy for consumers in a major financial firm. Growing up, I was a scout, and my grandmother had to teach me on one of my merit badges about snakes. <laughs> she said they were good snakes, poisonous snakes or were not good, and there were bad snakes, the poisonous snakes. But the worst kind of snakes, we were rural people, were the snakes that were good snakes that had gone bad. The king snake or the chicken snake that starts robbing the hen house. As a minister and a financial analyst, I applauded the Texas Credit Services Organization Act of 1997 as something that would help consumers repair their credit. I applaud systems like the systems we had in place and have for arbitration and legislation, but those are flawed. They're becoming good snakes that are becoming bad snakes. 
My grandmother said the only way to get rid of a good snake gone bad is to eliminate it. Now, I'm not my grandmother. I think maybe eliminating loopholes and leveling the playing field is important. As a preacher, I've all, often asked, am I my brother's keeper? And I think, yes, borrowers are, are challenged, but lenders need to be held accountable. Wise federal oversight and regulation are sorely needed, and I encourage you to closely monitor payment processing procedures, compliance safeguards that exist, and I might suggest any federal safeguards to protect the integrity of our payment institutions and systems, financial institutions, and consumers. And I look forward to working with you in this effort in the future. And I hope you come back to hear more about what we obviously, as a group, are passionate about as far as payday and auto lending. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Johnson. Rebecca Lightsey. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Lights. I'm executive director of Texas Appleseed. And I wanted to, to bring to your attention the issues with payday and auto title lending here in Texas. It's a $1.2 billion industry in terms of the fees that are collected from consumers here in Texas. Last year alone, there were 35,000 vehicles that were repossessed by the auto title lenders. It is not uncommon at all for these loans to carry an APR of up, up to or exceeding 600%. We, we need to be looking at this issue for a variety of reasons. There has not been significant action in the state legislature. There have been several cities that we applaud, including the city of Dallas, for taking steps to address this, although the industry has filed litigation against those cities. And equally importantly, what we see is the um, continual movement of the industry to find new products that evade any regulation. For instance, we are seeing an incredible increase in installment payday and auto title uh, loans. They have grown 82%. That market has grown 82% just in 2012 alone. These, uh, these abuses are ones that we, we need to address on a variety of levels, including looking at the arbitration uh, language. Because these loans all carry uh, the, the arbitration language, what we have seen at Appleseed is a handful of consumers who have attempted to avail themselves of these arbitration issues. But because of the secrecy that surrounds the arbitration, they're not allowed to speak publicly about what's happening. We've seen that there, the consumers who have gone through the arbitration, uh, the, the arbitration process do not feel it has been at all a fair process for them. They believe that the arbitrators are not listening carefully to what their situations are. They believe they have not seen a fair outcome in the arbitration hearings. So I join my colleagues in inviting you back to Dallas to look at this and other issues. Thank you Thank you, you Ms. Lightsey. Thomas Saliman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to Texas. Thank you for being here today. I represent International Bank Shares Corporation, which is the largest Hispanic-owned bank shares corporation in the United St in the continental United States. Holds four non uh, non-federal uh, state bank charters that are federally insured. We're here today to talk a little bit about arbitration clauses specifically. In October of 2011, IBC voluntarily changed its arbitration clauses to the Concepcion model. And I have a copy of the contract here that I'd like to hand up and make a We'd part We'd be happy of, to take it for the record. Together with some supplemental comments. IBC's concern today here is that we have an evolving process. We've not had a chance to look at the data that was provided this morning. We got it. We've not had a chance to address some of Director Cordray's comments that we'd like to talk about. So we would like to be sure that this process is deliberate and takes into account all of the issues. But one of the issues that we think is getting lost is this. 
CFPB's charter under Dodd-Frank Section 20, uh, 1028 does not take in every arbitration contract. And the real risk of this process without thinking carefully about the public interest is, is there some special public interest that appends to these contracts that doesn't append to the rental furniture or my cell phone bill or cable television or those things that may be outside of this charter? We believe strongly that the class action process is abused. We've been involved in four class actions out of our offices in Laredo, Texas in the last three years. Two were brought by a law firm in Pittsburgh. One was brought by a law firm in Miami. What does this tell us about the local nature of class actions? And that is a serious concern. This is about the best and most economical way of resolving disputes for those who are aggrieved rather than on people who may not exist as a class. Thank you, Mr. Alamond. Thank We'd be happy much. to take further comment as we progress in this important work. I have it to hand up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Arkis Parasharam. It's pretty close, but. Uh, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> it's a very hard name to say. It's, uh, I'm Archis Parasharami. I'm a lawyer. Beautiful name. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mom and dad will be proud. <laughs> uh, I'm a, a lawyer at Mayor Brown, and I work on uh, both arbitration agreements and defending companies uh, in class actions. And you know what, what I took from the study, and I've only had a little bit of a chance to, to really uh, look at it, but what I, what I see is that it looks like the terms of arbitration clauses are evolving and in a positive direction, and it's becoming harder to say, and I think this is a good thing, that arbitration agreements are unfair to individuals who pursue arbitration. Increasingly, arbitration agreements use the AAA's rules. Uh, that's a nonprofit organization that exists to facilitate dispute resolution. And so really what both the subtext and in some cases the text of the discussion has been, has been about the fairness of, of uh, the waiver of class actions. And so I was really heartened to hear that uh, Director Cordray said that the agency is going to dig more deeply into class actions. I think these preliminary results really do just a little bit of work. Take a look at, at six, six class actions, maybe sort of a handful. Um, and I think maybe a more comprehensive treatment of class actions is in order. I think if the debate is over whether consumers benefit more from the availability of uh, inexpensive arbitration or participation in class actions, that's, then it's imperative that the Bureau take a, a sort of a legitimate study of class actions, study them more comprehensively. Now, our, our firm uh, working in conjunction with the Chamber recently issued a study of class actions uh, in 2009. And unfortunately, what we found was that class actions have not really been benefiting consumers. The vast majority of class actions are, are dismissed either by the named plaintiff or by courts. Uh, th those that settle, and, and none go to trial, at least none of the ones we studied went to trial. So the notion that class actions promote the jury trial is, is at least in my view, questionable. Um, but the ones that were settled on a class basis, it turned out that in many cases, the rate of participation of class members was under 10%, sometimes even under 1%. And so then, if you have a class action where 90% of class members or 99% plus don't benefit, you know, is it really helpful? I know uh, some of the professors spoke about the benefits of class actions, uh, and maybe in theory they made sense, in practice they do not. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for your comments. Jessica Lesser. Hi, I'm a private practice attorney here in Dallas. Is this on? Can't really hear. Okay, good. Um, I represent consumers. I've also been a regulator in the past for the Attorney General's office, and I was in industry representing debt collectors and auto finance companies. I've now chosen where I represent nothing but consumers, and every day what we forget on these arbitrations we're talking about litigation over fraud that created the contract that includes litigation, the arbitration clause. So do we allow a car dealer to have an arbitration clause in a contract and then commit a deceptive tra uh, trade practice, but not allow the consumer the redress in private court systems? The other problem I have really falls more on a true jurisprudential philosophical view. What happens to our body of law? How do we know interpretations, in court interpretations of statutes, and how it evolves as time evolves and society evolves? Stare decisis seems to go away and disappear. 
as well as um, who's grading the arbitrator's report card. We have an appellate system that if a trial court messes up, well, we get to go do up there and it goes again. A lot of times the trial courts don't mess up because somebody's looking over their shoulder and as somebody who appears in front of a lot of trial courts, I get, well, I just care about who's grading my report card. That process of checks and balance is vital to continue the equalization of rights of consumers, but not getting in the way of industry continuing to practice. Um, I just, I mean, and that's kind of where it's how do you create that where everybody wins? Again, we are talking about voluntary. No, if you want to go to arbitration, go. We have a similar thing, I hope, that you guys look into under the FCRA to handle disputes. As a lawyer who has handled FCRA disputes for 16 years on both sides, I can tell you, you know, those don't get fixed. And so you have a real life example of consumer arbitration or ability to fix it without calling up the lawyer to go in there and fix it. And because lawyer can get in the way and make some money and all of that, but it hasn't worked. So now transferring it to more industries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lesser. It. And I would encourage everyone to consider if you have a constituent or a client with a consumer finance issue to file a complaint with the Bureau, including uh, complaints addressing credit reporting agency errors. The information is here on this side. Joanne Grosharat. Uh, Grosshart. Grosshart. Um, this is a rat. This is a rat. This is what all payday owners are, the rats. Okay, to my speech. <laughs> Paydays rape the poor and uneducated and are destroying my end of Richardson. Richardson City Council has made it clear to me that they don't give a D underscore 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 and have no intention of putting a usury limit on paydays of 8% or 800% plus interest or more. Churches are hurt because their donations from their members go to paydays. If John borrows, and this is a true case too, John borrows $200 needs to pay 30 a week interest. He pays and pays and pays and pays and thinks his loan is lowered, but he still owes $200. Next page. He can't make his rent because it's paid uh, 125 interest. He defaults. The payday keeps his car. He can't get to work and is fired. He asks the churches to pay his rent. Next month, his family moves to a shelter. This is interesting. At Lone Star Car Payday, this who takes and possesses these $35,000 35, cars a year, this is a, a, a sign that says, do you need a car? And this is in its same lot that the people are taking, okay? Does this make sense? He's making double. Okay. Uh, this will continue to happen unless the USA regulates paydays, APR interests. A deal with a payday is a deal with the devil. The paydays and the devil own you. Come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. That's what a payday is. And as a side of good negotiation, is when both parties walk away satisfied. And I learned this from the best negotiation teacher in the United States, of which I cannot remember his name, but he wrote all the books, and that's what I learned after three hours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grohart. We'd be happy to take your statement for the record. Alan Hun. Hi, I'm Alan Hunt. I'm general counsel at Nissan Motor Acceptance Corporation. I want to welcome you to Texas. My colleague Scott was on the dais with you. And I just wanted to just speak from the company's perspective for a minute. And I, I think you, you have a lot of companies that, that want arbitration to be a fair process for customers. We truly do want customers to be able to dispute with us on our dime any reasonable dispute they have. And uh, I, I think one of the things you get in a forum like this, unfortunately, is the bad people don't show up. That is, that the people who abuse things aren't here to defend uh, what they do to people. And, but you do get a lot of responsible corporate citizens who, who want to work with you and with the consumer advocates to try to find solutions to problems. I, uh, I, one of the things I caution you on is that, that arbitration is young, right? And so one of the things you run into when you look at, at quantitative analysis is that you won't have as much 
with arbitration. And you've got a long history of litigation. And unfortunately, when you evaluate arbitration means sometimes people are choosing litigation because that's what's been done a long time. And consumer advocates are suspicious of arbitration in many instances. And from some of these anecdotes, you might understand why, obviously. But the, I think the suggestion would be that, that there's a lot of responsible corporate citizens that want to work with the CFPB uh, to reach solutions to, uh, I think there is a way to have arbitration that's done in a very fair manner. Uh, we want consumers to have, uh, have fair opportunities for dispute with us and uh, really look forward to working with you to try to reach that end. Thank you, Mr. Hun. Juanita Wallace. Hi, I'm Juanita Wallace, Dallas Branch NAACP president. And I come, I'm very thankful for you coming here. But I come because I'm really very, very concerned about the payday loans and all of that other mess that goes along with it. Uh, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of it. And we need something done. Now, with the uh, arbitration, I wanted to ask you if within the actual clause, do you have something embedded in that law that talks about PR? In other words, public relations. If people are not aware of the law and they don't have an understanding and education of the law, then they cannot access the law and nor will they be able to use it. So that's the one thing that I'm very concerned about. Thank you. I'd love for you to com come back to Dallas and to monitor these lenders and their lack of transparency and their lack of unjust treatment to the people that have no other recourse but to use their services. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and thank you again for the invitation. Um, Kyla Jaquez, or Jax. Hello, my name is Kiyla Jacques, and I am the Public Policy Coordinator at City Square under the supervision of Reverend Gerald Britt. Uh, City Square is a social service provider here in the heart of Dallas. Our work centers around um, services that support individuals in poverty. Uh, we focus on four areas, hunger, health, housing, and my department falls under hope. We're one of very few so social service providers that also have a social justice arm. And the work that we've done locally on predatory lending and auto title loans has been in partnership with the Anti-Poverty Coalition of Greater Dallas. I want to share with you a, a story because we uh, touch the lives of more than 70,000 people annually. And there was a point in time where we had funding to provide financial counseling and services for the individuals that we provide service to. We call them neighbors and not clients. And in servicing um, some of our clients, we find that about 40% of them suffer from uh, being stuck in the cycle of debt due to payday and auto title loans. This particular story is of a, a lady who lives in one of our uh, housing developments, and she took out a payday loan of $300 to buy clothing and school supplies for three of her children. Um, after going through the cycle and not being able to pay the loan off, she paid more than $900 over the cost of her of her uh, rent for that month. Um, and through the counseling service, was able to uh, receive some financial assistance. But we no longer have funding for that program anymore. We no longer have funding for the financial literacy. Um, the work that we've done in partnership with the Anti-Poverty Coalition, uh, that includes the United Way, it includes um, Catholic Charities, it includes a number of nonprofit service providers, the faith community. It also includes business representatives, um, such as the AARP. And we worked together to put in place a piece of legislation that was monumental across the nation. We did that in partnership representing the community who doesn't have funds to represent themselves at the state level or the local level. They don't have funds for lobbyists. They don't have funds for lawyers. What we found is that despite the, the legislation that is in place locally, there's um, not the means for enforcement. And so the industry continues to get away with their practices um, locally. It's already been mentioned the, the presence that exists in this state. And through partnership, we continue to work on statewide legislation. This work cannot be done alone. And so we encourage you to continue the good work that you're doing, and we thank you for it, knowing that we'll continue to fight alongside our neighbors and those that we serve so that they can have a quality of life that is respectable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and thank you for the work that you do independently and in coalition uh, the work that we are hearing from you is tremendous and valuable. Julia Duncan. 
Thanks. Good afternoon, I'm Julia Duncan and I'm with the American Association for Justice. The AAJ would like to applaud the CFPB for taking the first steps to restore accountability by addressing forced arbitration. Forced arbitration puts all Americans' financial security at risk. It allows corporations to evade accountability and in essence grants them a license to steal and to violate state and federal laws. Forced arbitration has become the biggest barrier for Americans seeking justice, especially those who want to hold a bank accountable for stealing what may be considered a small amount to one person, but when multiplied by every customer the bank has stolen from turns out to be a significant amount of money. When faced with being forced into individual, private, secret arbitration, the consumer often decides she does not have the time or money to try and hold the bank accountable, and the bank gets off scot-free, even for massive violations of state and federal law. After the Supreme Court decisions favoring forced arbitration over consumers' access to justice, accountability has been severely limited, and in many cases, completely denied. I also want to take a minute to reiterate what some of my colleagues said about voluntary versus forced. I have never heard a consumer advocate, including those of us at the American Association for Justice, opposed to voluntary arbitration. There are other means of resolving disputes that can be supported and should be supported by all parties. What we're talking about here is forced arbitration. And when one side, in this case, large corporations and banks, have the power to force individual consumers into a forced arbitration system under the rules that they write, we don't have to look very far to know who the forced arbitration system benefits. If we create a system that's voluntary and post-dispute, and it is, in fact, truly fair and cheaper, there's no reason that both banks and consumers couldn't benefit from that. Thank In you, reality, Duncan. accountability must be restored, and we look forward to working with the We'd CFPB. We'd be happy to take the entirety of your statement. Thank you. Manuel Robles. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, director and members of the CFPB. Uh, my name is Manuel Robles, and I previously worked in the payday and title loan industry, specifically at Advance America in Dallas and the cash store in Grand Prairie, uh, Grand Prairie, Texas. At the time, it was a job, but the longer I was employed by these lenders, the more I regretted performing some of the practices I was called on to do. Ultimately, my resistance led to my being let go. There's much I can say, but given the limited amount of time, I will briefly speak about my experiences in the industry strategies to target clients through location selection, the collection practices, and my experience with and witness to industry practices that coerced employees and clients to sign petitions, petitions for the purpose of le legislative advocacy. Generally, the strategy was to target low-income areas. Our busy stores tended to be specifically in those areas where there was a perceived need for small dollar loans and a prevalence of financial illiter illiteracy. The goal was not to fulfill a need so much as to de derive profit from such needs. Uh, the most glaring example of the industry's location and targeting strategies occurred after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. As the victims of the storm were flowing into the greater Dallas area, many were moved into the southern part of, of Dallas and Grand Prairie area, and it was a prime opportunity to capitalize on the desperation of the impoverished demographic. Through conversations with my management at the time, it was made clear to me that our company was opening new, store, new stores in order to do just that. As for collection practices, an uncomfortable role that I was required to take on was that of a collector. For the lack of a better word, I was to make home visits to inquire and demand payment on delinquent accounts. In a word, I was meant to intimidate clients. <clears throat> I would make phone calls as well for these. I was coached to use whatever means possible to not take no for an answer. The expectation was that I would continually pester and demand until the store got its money. When there was a legislative threat of any of these lucrative practices that the industry used, the company would send out petitions. Customers in their flurry, flurry of signing forms would oftentimes sign the petition as well. We acted like we expected them to, and we wouldn't necessarily tell them the full ramifications of the petition. Thank as, you, Mr. Robles. We'd be happy okay. to take the entire statement. Thank you. Where Wendell?
Good afternoon. My name is Ware Wendell. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Consumer Group uh, Texas Watch. We're a nonprofit consumer group based in Austin with over 20,000 grassroots activists across the state. I'm also an attorney in private practice focusing on consumer cases, and I'm here to testify in both capacities. Forced arbitration clauses are increasingly inescapable, and they're unjust. Uh, consumers, by merely participating in the marketplace, are being forced to have their consumer and, uh, and constitutional rights stripped away from them. It's a fiction that consumers are able to freely negotiate these clauses. And I ask the CFPB, and I'm so glad that it's in existence and doing this important work, to please ban forced arbitration clauses. We've heard why arbitration is a flawed process. It precludes class actions, which is the only relief available to uh, consumers who have been subjected to widespread harm. It's conducted in secret. Discovery is limited, which affects public safety. Um, and as a consumer attorney, I'm precluded from telling you my experiences in arbitration. I hold in my hand the AAA Consumer Due Process Protocol. Principle 12 tells me that those were confidential proceedings. Suffice it to say, I will never take another case through arbitration on a contingency. Thank you, Mr. Wendell. We'd be happy to take your materials for the record. Nina Newberry. First of all, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity today and for the work that you all are doing. I'm uh, Nina Newberry. I'm the president of Newberry Executive Solutions, and I'm also the chair of the United Way Advocacy Committee, so I'm here in that capacity today. And United Way really focuses on three areas, income, education, and health. And in May, we announced $50 million of investments in the community, and $5 million of that is really targeted towards lower-income individuals to really help them build stronger financial futures. But one of the things that we consistently hear is that, um, from our service providers, is that payday and auto title lenders are really posing a huge barrier for their, uh, for their clients and undermining their work and the investments that we're making in the community. The average consumer doesn't really understand what they're sign signing and what the implications are if they don't meet the terms of, of the contract. And so while we don't provide direct services, United Way does frequently get calls um, from individuals in the community. I've got an example of an elderly lady who um, lives in Balch Springs and had taken out a loan and was actually a few dollars short of being able to uh, meet the, the payment. Actually was trying to work with the lender to make the payment. They ended up taking her car in the middle of the night. and. And actually, on, on average, 92 vehicles are repossessed in the Dallas, Irving, and Plano region each week. And borrowers in our region generally pay $24 for each $100 that they borrow. And so, in response, United Way has really focused on three specific things. Uh, number one, we've been meeting with state legislators to try to affect change. So there's a lot more discussion happening, but at the end of the day, nothing's really been passed that's making a difference. We need some action taken at the state or, or federal level because the second thing we have done is to really focus on city ordinances. And Dallas has done a great job, and some of the other um, cities here have as well, but it's not enough. And then the third piece is we have been doing um, secret shopper visits, and I just want to share a couple of things from that because the findings are pretty shocking. The APR ranges from 36% to 927%. Our secret shoppers are being encouraged to take out even bigger loans, and in fact, not meet the, the obligations of the Thank initial you, loan. Thank you, Ms. Newberry. I'd be happy to take the entirety of the findings okay. for the Thank record. Thank you. Well, we appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Colonel Patrick Smith. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Colonel Pat Smith. I'm uh, the Director of Local Outreach at Denton Bible Church in Denton, Texas. I'm also a board member with United Way of Denton County. Uh, I also oversee all local outreach. We're the largest church in town in Denton. Uh, we were uh, very avid or active in passing our local ordinance that uh, regulated payday lenders. My brief comments are, one, I have had to refer or deal with numerous cases of uh, individuals with payday, lo payday loans. 
the arbitration process that we followed in the one case was, um, it, was it was non-existent. Uh, the way the contract was structured, uh, this per lady had no recourse. She had no understanding. She was a 73-year-old widow. Her father or her husband was a, re a World War II veteran. She had no understanding of what arbitration was. So education is key. Uh, the second uh, case, and we finally settled that. Uh, the church and people in the community stepped up and, and basically paid $10,000 for what started out to be a $75 loan. Uh, so from then on, I've now referred cases to a local law firm, and we have filed a class action lawsuit against uh, Title Max. Uh, and I go back to the, what a previous comment was made, that there is fraud in these contracts. But the people that are signing these contracts don't have legal counsel. They don't have the expertise to review and understand what they're signing. And there's only one way to raise visibility to fraudulent practices, and that is through a lawsuit. Thank and you. And lack of transparency is, is really hurting our citizens of our country. Thank you for your comments. Kelvin Bass. Dean Malone. Good afternoon. My name is Dean Malone. I'm a lawyer here in Dallas, and I represent uh, consumers. I have a small law firm. We represent consumers primarily in abusive debt collection and car dealer fraud cases. There's a, a fiction out there that consumers have some idea as to what they're signing when they agree to forced arbitration. And we all know by forced arbitration, it's, mind, it's binding mandatory arbitration, pre-dispute, and it's typically, in the case of a retail installment contract, on the back of the agreement. Consumers rarely, if ever, read the back of such agreements, and even if they had, they have no clue as to what arbitration is. When people show up in my office and I have to tell them, hey, you've got an arbitration agreement, and explain it to them, they had no idea that if they had a dispute with whoever it is we're uh, having an issue with, that they wouldn't get a judge and they wouldn't get a jury, but they'd get someone appointed by an organization that they'd never heard of. Arbitration affects access to the courts. It affects access of consumers to redress. The plaintiff's bar and the defendant's bar know that arbitration, when it's in an agreement, affects the value of a claim. Uh, for years, my, my uh, firm would not take car dealer fraud cases because we couldn't economically do so. I've got a good friend who's an attorney who did take car dealer fraud cases and no longer does so because of arbitration. arbitration thank you, Mr. Malone. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. Giannis Banks. Lisa Sherrod. Hi, uh, Giannis Banks. I'm with the Texas NAACP. Um, I want to just second the, the comments that have already been made about payday lending and car title loans and that rebeat that horse even more. I think enough has been said about it. It's not much I can add to it. Just, more, just to say that we will welcome you back, not just to Dallas, but all of Texas. Uh, so you can hear the stories from elsewhere in Houston, El Paso, San Antonio, um, and, and other places. So you can hear more of the stories and the, and the suffering that people are going through. Uh, I do want a sentiment that um, we feel like when it comes to arbitration, there needs to be a better cross-section of arbitrators. Um, so you can have, you know, you have a lot of them who may have close ties to the industry that they are maybe trying to arbitrate. So you want to have more, a broader range of people who can do the arbitration. Um, and we agree with what's been said, arbitration should be optional. It shouldn't be forced, it shouldn't be mandatory. If both parties agree to arbitration, that's good. If not, let the, let the uh, consumer have their day in court, take them to court and have uh, their day there to try to get their, their resolution. Um, we also believe that uh, there should be some kind of certificate of certification through y'all that arbitrators, arbitrators should have to get. Uh, we understand that there's two companies already that do it, but there should be some kind of uh, certification through the CFPB that arbitrators have to go through and make sure that they are operating in a proper way. Uh, and have specific rules for consumer arbitrators as well uh, or through y'all and have a program set up to increase the number of arbitrators. Uh, and we agree that you should look at the track record of the arbitrators also. If you see that you know, the, the consumer should be able to see, and the lawyers who represent the consumers should be able to see which arbitrators are, are how are they ruling. If you see arbitrators are ruling 90% of the time for one certain company, um, people should know that. Because of course they're gonna keep going back to that arbitrator. They will have that kind of, of database set up to know that yes, this person, this 
have rules in our favor more times than anything else. We want to keep going back to them. And as lawyers, uh, when I was speaking to my boss uh, this morning, and um, he was saying when they do their arbitration, you know, he'll have a list of names that he can throw out, and they agree if it's in the same list. That's the person they take. And thank if you, you Mr. Banks. Thank Happy you. to take all of your comments. If you'd like to Xerox them and give them to staff. Not a problem. Lisa Sherrod. Pat Smith. Stuart Miller. That concludes the CFPB's field hearing at the Black Academy of the Arts and Letters in Dallas, Texas. Thank you all for taking the time to join the CFPB today, and thank you all who joined us by live stream at consumerfinance.gov. Have a great afternoon. We would be happy to take folks' written statements to augment the record of this field hearing. Thank you, Dallas, Texas.